So welcome again. I see some people are joining us. Um, welcome. My name is Dawn. We're just going through some housekeeping and then with our speaker will start shortly. Um, so tonight, um, most of you did um, thank you very much. You paid a ticket fee, but I do want to mention um, this most of this pandemic year, we have been doing our programs for free or for a suggested donation. So we're always happy to get your um, your ticket fees um, and or donations towards our um, programs like this. We appreciate it. You'll see many more of our programs are free. So um, that is a cause we always like to underwrite if we can. Um, and the other request I'll make is uh, because you are signed up for this webinar, I have your email address and you will most likely get a survey from the museum in about three weeks time. This survey is helping us do our strategic planning process, which I'm very excited about. Um, so it'll be really um, kind of an enjoyable survey to answer. Uh, if you've had any interaction with the RJD, we're curious about your opinions um, on programming like this and, and visitation if you've come to the museum before. So, Look for that in your email and um, help us out by filling that out. So with that, um, I just wanna give my thanks to all of you that are here in attendance, to the Roach family members that are in attendance and have supported us years over years, uh, to Jones family members that are in attendance, to my board members that are in attendance. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I think we've got a great speaker scheduled and you'll enjoy her. So uh, with that, I would like to introduce our speaker. Our speaker tonight has been to the museum, physically to the museum many times in the past and has um, spoken here on this topic before. And we ask her back every, every year because she's so wonderful. Dr. Crabtree is associate professor at San Francisco State University. She has lectured here previously. Some of you may have caught her at a lecture a couple of years back. And she's currently writing a graphic novel about William Roach Sr. Um, so I know she's going to fill you in more on, um, on that project. I hope she will talk a bit about that project. And I'd like to let her take it from here. Sarah. All right. Thank you, Dawn. And let's see. OK. Can everybody see that? Is that okay? Yes, we can see those slides. Okay. And I, I welcome anyone again, if you have any trouble with tech or uh, you wanna pass a message on to the speaker, just put it right in the chat and I will um, interrupt if we need to go a little slower or be louder, I can let her know. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Dawn, for that introduction. Thank you for inviting me back to the Roach Jones Duff House. Um, I wish that I were physically with all of you in person, um, not only because that would be a better, more normal world, but also because I consider myself an East Coaster stranded on the West Coast. Um, and I am quite literally stranded on the West Coast for the last year. It's been hard for me not to get back home again. Um, and thank you all for coming and for uh, joining me virtually. Um, I always appreciate people's comments after my presentation. I've had an awful lot of people follow up with me via email, which I'm happy to put in the chat afterwards and, and so generously share their ideas and sort of family lore, tidbits, um, questions that they have. And, and I've really enjoyed those interactions. So, um, you know, it's about to be a big uh, half decade for people in my field. Um, and that is at the 250th anniversary of the Revolutionary War events are coming up. And very strategically minded of my colleagues have been planning for this for quite some time. I'm a little bit late to the game and I think we've all lost about a year uh, off of our schemes. Um, but uh, so when Dawn invited me to speak to all of you, I sort of thought, well, here's an opportunity for me to start thinking about the Roach um, story and what it means to the revolutionary celebrations um, that will soon be coming. And so I, I threw out this title, 1773 Reconsidered. Um, and the reason that I thought about it is, you know, I, I have here pictures of um, some, popular history framings 
there is a really interesting and important conversation going on right now about um, founding narratives, about uh, the stories of our beginnings as a country. And some of you will be familiar with the very um, powerful, very moving 1619 project um, Nicole Hannah-Jones and a group of um, really important thinkers and scholars contributed to this volume that argues that the true starting date of this country is 1619, that is the year that enslaved peoples uh, first arrived on the shores of Virginia. There was a very uh, controversial recent retort by the Trump administration called the 1776 report, um, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that um, in the Q&A afterwards. Um, some more scholarly ones that people may not be aware of, Eric Foner, a very important um, historian for the Reconstruction era, he writes a book called The Second Founding, and he argues that the story of this country truly begins again for a second time, sort of a rebirth um, in uh, the 1860s and 70s during the era of Reconstruction. Uh, Nell Irvin Painter, a historian I've admired for a very long time, she argues that 1898 is actually the beginning of the American empire, that that's a pivotal year, that that tells the story of the modern United States. And then most recently, I was very moved by an article in The Atlantic by a journalist named Adam Sewer, and he wrote um, a piece called The Third Republic. And he argues that the United States, like France, has actually had three republics. We're in the Third Republic right now, and that that republic is founded by John Lewis um, and other civil rights leaders in 1964 and 1965, that that is a third beginning to this country. So we have these different ways of understanding the stories of the United States. Um, we also have these different ways of understanding the war for independence. Um, and I refer to it as the war for independence because that's a more clearly defined way of understanding the events of the 1770s and 1780s. The war for independence you know, begins in 1775 with the first shots fired. It ends in 1783 with the Treaty of Paris. But there are many other beginning points and end points for understanding um, the American Revolution, which is a broader period than the War of Independence that encompasses more people, a wider geography, more issues, more years. And you can see here, I just grabbed this um, graph from the internet, you know, other dates to start, it could be 1763, could be 1770, all suggest 1773. And of course the revolution continues long after the war ends. Um, some historians, myself included, would argue that the war doesn't really end, the American Revolution doesn't end until 1786 with Shays' Rebellion and 1787 with the adoption of the US Constitution. So. So I offer this as framing, I'll come back to this slide um, at the end of my talk and I'll be interested to see what people think, but to kind of give you an insight as to, I think that the Roach story is an important one for understanding the beginnings of the United States and also understanding the United States now. And I think 1773 is this really pivotal moment for the Roach family. Um, and for uh, their story moving forward. So that it was my kind of bold title, 1773 Reconsidered. So there we go, start my Prezi. So, so this part of the story is familiar to some of you, but it's the best part of the story. Um, it's the most fun part of the story to tell. And for those of you who, um, who haven't heard me talk about William Roach before, um, I sort of try and have a slam bang beginning, um, which is uh, Roach begins his story with, it all began with a boatload of bayonets. Um, and, uh, and he tells a particular story in his um, memoir written in the 80th year of his age. Um, it was a story that I incorporated into my first book, which was called Holy Nation. Um, and it's a story of his trials and tribulations during what we call, the historian, historians call, um, the Age of Revolution, which is roughly 1770 to 1820. And I, I sort of lovingly call him um, the Forrest Gump of treason. William Roach sort of uh, 
and he himself was in, incredulous as to the situations he continued to find himself in. Um, but his story begins on Nantucket and truly spans the entire Atlantic world. And so I'm gonna start with this story and then, um, and then the story shifts and I tell, um, I tell another story uh, that, um, that Roach didn't share um, uh, in his memoir, um, a story that sort of parallels the first one. Um, and then sort of my job as a historian and what I always enjoy talking to everybody about is how do we understand these two stories together? So let me start this first story um, of William Roach and then um, and we'll go through those stages and then I'll, I'll take you through the second less well-known story. So William Roach Sr. Um, was born in 1734 on the island of Nantucket, a stronghold of Quakerism in the 18th century. He was an elder in the Nantucket meeting and an important proponent of the Quaker Reformation. We pick up his story in, eight, in 1764, when he accepted a large quantity of weapons as repayment for a debt. True to his interpretation of Friends' pacifist principles, um, Quakers were opposed to violence in all forms, um, uh, most publicly and sort of notoriously all forms of warfare. Roach agreed to sell the muskets, which could be used for hunting, but not the bayonets, because in his words, quote, as this instrument is purposefully made and used for the destruction of mankind, I can put no weapon into a man's hands to destroy another that I cannot use myself in the same way. And so according to Roach's later testimony, he then moved the bayonets to one of his warehouses and forgot about them entirely. But with the outbreak of war between Great Britain and the colonies in 1775, an unnamed Massachusetts official demanded he furnish the weapons to the Patriots. An appalled Roach host hastily loaded up a ship with the contraband and sank it several miles offshore. Suffice it to say, this action displeased the resource-starved Americans who promptly hauled Roach in front of the Committee for Safety to answer for his actions. He cited his defense with his religious opposition to all bloodshed, and the committee begrudgingly released him. Now, if it were me, I would have kept my head down and my mouth shut, but that is not what William Roach decided. The war had placed Nantucketers in an impossible position. Two considerations prevented them from joining the Patriots, their pacifism, most of them were Quakers, and their business. Whale oil was the only product Nantucket had to sell, and Islanders knew they would go broke without access to the British market. Americans, very few Americans were wealthy enough to be able to purchase whale oil, and there weren't as many cities um, able to buy whale oil in the Americas as there were in Europe. But the same two considerations also prevented them from joining the Loyalists. Nantucket imported all of its foodstuffs from the mainland, and Islanders knew they would go hungry without access to the American market. So Nantucket is in this really difficult position because they need to buy food from the Americas, but the money that they need to buy that food, they have to sell their whale oil to Great Britain. So they're really in this impossible position. As a result, the Quaker majority tried desperately to remain neutral during the conflict, but their refusal to take sides cost them dearly. Roach led a three-person delegation to implore American and British officials to send food and medicine to the starving, impoverished islanders. Long story short, Roach boarded a British vessel in occupied New York without a pass from the Patriot government, and Massachusetts charged him with high treason. The House convicted him, the Senate returned a hung jury. Only the peace months later affected his release. And Roach as much um, says in his memoir that he had prepared to die. Um, you know, the, the case, his sons were particularly frustrated that he, um, that he wouldn't try and bribe his way out of the situation, but he believed very much that he was standing and therefore suffering for his principles. And here's where the Roach's story goes from the extraordinary to the incredible. So the peace ruined the island of Nantucket as the hefty British tariffs now levied on American goods bankrupted whalers. Desperate islanders scattered in search of solutions. One group moved to Hudson, New York. Another moved to Nova Scotia. There was a group of people that gave up whaling entirely and they founded um, New Garden in North Carolina. 
And Roach, in a move he would defend for the rest of his life, sailed to London to meet with a young chancellor of the exchequer, William Pitt. The bitter British drove a hard bargain. So Roach approached, approached France. King Louis the 14th immediately agreed to all terms, or the 16th, immediately agreed to all terms, which crucially included two key demands. Friends were granted full and free enjoyment of religion, and they were permitted an entire exemption from military requisitions of every kind. So we see that in his negotiations, Roach really prioritized his religion and the religion of the Nantucketers he would bring with him. Thus Roach and 32 Nantucket families began relocating the entire enterprise to Dunkirk, France in January of 1787. I'll, like, I'll let Roach take back over the narration. And he writes in a letter to his wife, quote, never did I imagine I would find myself in the middle of another revolution. He wrote in two different letters as tensions escalated between the foreign pacifists and their resentful, suspicious neighbors. Finally, in 1791, the National Assembly summoned Roach, charging him once more with disloyalty to a patriot cause. And though Roach avoided conviction for a second time, Mirabeau counseled his family that, um, that the people and property were no longer safe in France. And here you see I've put a little um, uh, revolutionary patriot cap on Mirabeau. Part of the reason that Roach, um, the Roaches got into so much trouble is that they refused to don um, the clothing of the French revolutionary, the French patriots, um, sticking to their sort of dour Quaker attire. This warning was soon realized as Roach almost immediately landed in hot water for refusing to illuminate his windows in celebration of French victories. An angry mob gathered in the center of town where one of Roach's servants overheard their plans to march on his home and burn it to the ground with all residents inside. The mayor caught wind of this plot and begged William and his son Benjamin to leave town, but both men refused. Disaster was only averted when the mayor ordered a scaffolding-like contraption erected with lanterns strategically placed to make it appear as though their windows were lit. The crowd placated, dispersed, but the roaches were un understandably shaken. They fled to Milford Haven. Um, Benjamin had actually come over to the European continent um, with William before the rest of his family and they had scoped out a bunch of different ports and they had considered Milford Haven at the time, but um, it was a little bit too much of a backwater. But now that appealed to them. They wanted to get out of the crosshairs of the war. Um, so uh, Milford Haven was a Welsh town where boosters promised the ports were deep, the people were welcoming, and most importantly, the war would remain far away from these poor beleaguered pacifists. But Benjamin arrived the very same day that England declared war against France. Neighbors observed his foreign dress, his Quaker dress, but it was seen as being un-British, heard his family speaking French, noted the timing of his arrival, and promptly published an article in the local paper identifying him as a French spy. Roach managed to convince his new compatriots and his government that this wasn't the case, but he remained paranoid enough that he instructed his sons to number all of their correspondence as he thought their mail was being intercepted. Roach never seemed to find any concrete proof that he and his family remained under surveillance, but they all nevertheless watched in horror as the small sleepy town became overnight one of the most important ports for the British naval fleet during the wars against France. By this time, the Roaches were weary of war and its consequences. Roach's son, Benjamin, left the Society of Friends while William himself left Great Britain. In 1798, there we go. Just over two decades since his ordeal began and his odyssey commenced, he relocated one last time to New Bedford, Massachusetts, where he retired from business and remained with his family until his death in 1828. Unfortunately, the former president and Roach's everlasting nemesis, John Adams, heard of his arrival back in town and insisted the newspaper reprint word for word the accusations cited in his treason trial. Roach accused his lifelong nemesis of having entered into a second childhood and set about writing his memorandum, the source for much of this first part of the story, in response. So, um, so this 
part of the story really formed the bedrock for my first book. And my first book called Holy Nation, I argue that the Quakers don't see themselves as being American or British or French. They see themselves as being part of a larger transnational community of pacifists who are united in a belief, a set of beliefs, of religious beliefs against war, um, also beliefs about simplicity, soon to be beliefs about um, abolitionism and later women's equality. And so, um, you know, the Americans thought that in this kind of with us or against us moment, the Americans accused him of being British, the British accused him of being American, he goes to France, the French accuse him of being British, he sails to Britain, the British accuse him of being French, and Roach just tries to say over and over and over again, I'm from Nantucket, you know, I don't, I'm not, I don't actively side, um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not taking an active side in the war, I'm outside of these worldly politics. And I, I still believe that's true. You know, I think this is an important part of the story and I wanna come back to that at the end of my presentation, but it's not the entire story. And so um, my second book, um, which is tentatively titled Whaler, Traitor, Coward, Spy, um, began when in my dissertation defense, I had um, a colleague say to me that it sounded much more like William Roach was trying to offshore his business than trying to save the world. Um, and so uh, I sort of sat there and let that wash over me. And I thought, you know, I had, I had really spent years thinking carefully about Roach's religion, and I hadn't spent as much time thinking about his business, his wealth, because Roach was a phenomenally wealthy man, one of the wealthiest men in the British Empire, um, a man who and I always have to get this dig in. It has been said, beat John Hancock so badly at business, he had no choice but to turn to politics. And so as I began to reconsider his actions from this angle, his story took another, I think, even more incredible turn. So the story for this, um, uh, the timeline for this story is roughly the same. And it begins, here we are in 1773, almost unbelievably, at the infamous Tea Party. The Roaches, father Joseph and brother Francis owned two of the three ships destroyed in Boston Harbor that night. To make another long story short, Francis, who was 22 at the time, and I always have to pause and think about what Francis Roach had placed on his shoulders and also what he managed to accomplish at this incredibly young age, sailed to Great Britain immediately after the fateful December night to affirm his loyalty to the crown and to request compensation from parliament. He continued to lobby the British government once war was declared, pleading for passes to pursue whaling off the Falkland Islands. His scheme was to obtain British and colonial passes to take British and colonial crews um, uh, on British and colonial ships to neutral waters far away from the conflict. I will admit that I had always underestimated William's kid brother, but it does seem that Francis was the one who first began to develop the strategy that would propel the whaling, and well, the Roach family specifically, but the whaling industry more broadly into the so-called golden age of the 19th century. And so we see here in a letter to Aaron Lopez, um, who's a, a local a merchant, one of the important early Jewish merchants from the colonial era, um, that he is, shall we say, playing fast and loose with the idea of residency and therefore loyalty in order to save his most valuable assets, which are his ships, and to launch um, his unsuccessful, unfortunately, whaling gambit in the neutral waters of the South Atlantic. And so here we see Francis is writing to Lopez and he says, should any of our whalemen be seized by the late restraining act and carried to any port in the West Indies, you will doubtless direct the master to make a claim for yourself a resident at Jamaica and for me a resident in London and bring the case to England where these claims may be supported and the property saved. So he's saying if the British seize one of their whaling vessels, you know, Aaron Lopez should claim that he lives in the West Indies, even though he's from Rhode Island, um, and Francis Roach, who's temporarily in London, will say that he's a British citizen in, in, in London in order that um, the British can't seize their ships. And so here we really see 
um, that uh, Francis was pioneering a strategy that would carry the Roach family through the next 30 years. And so, um, you know, many of you may be familiar with this family tree, but for those of you who, um, who don't know these generations of Roaches, Joseph is the father um, who married uh, Love Macy um, in Nantucket, converted to Quakerism, and he had three sons, um, William, who uh, senior, who I write about in my book, um, Joseph Jr., who died um, uh, right at the beginning of the revolution, and then Francis, um, who's kind of the key player here. If we follow William Jr.'s line, um, uh, he had several children, but William Jr. followed him into business, his son Benjamin, um, followed him into business, and then his oldest daughter, Elizabeth's um, husband, Samuel Rodman, also entered into the partnership. So during this period in time, we have Joseph, William, Francis, William Jr., Benjamin, and Samuel, and they form the kind of bedrock, later to be joined by Thomas, but they, um, they form the bedrock of this business. So Patriarch Joseph moved to New Bedford, and William's sons, Benjamin and William Jr., and his son-in-law, Samuel Rodman, joined the business uh, from Nantucket. William Sr. brought Benjamin to France. William Jr. moved, um, uh, as I said, to New Bedford to join grandfather Joseph, and Samuel Rodman remained in Nantucket. So Benjamin traveled frequently to London to coordinate with Uncle Francis, who tarried at Parliament. These six men, representing three generations of roaches, were no longer officially in business together, but neither did they act independently of one another. Instead, they claimed three different citizenships among them, American, British, and French, transferring the ownership and therefore flags of their ships as best suited their needs. And I'll share with you a couple of examples here. So we see in 1786, um, before uh, William sails for Great Britain and France, Benjamin is already there doing the negotiations. And he says to his son, you need not mention that the oil will come entirely duty free as ours, Francis's, is now in better terms than the American contract. Therefore, those that ship under us may reap the advantage and you should not disclose that part for the president, for the present. We see um, this continues when they're in France. And this is a letter to Samuel Rodman, who's still in Nantucket in 1792. This is uh, William Senior writing. And he says, remember to take out a new register for Anne in thine and my name only of Nantucket and make no mention of me being a resident in Dunkirk as I am only a visitor and make no mention of Benjamin's name who is a resident of France if the least difficulty at Nantucket take out at Bedford under William Jr.'s name. So here we see that, you know, who the manifest is being attributed to or um, who's, you know, legally entering into this contract is changing depending on what the terms are. And they continue here um, from Milford Haven, William Jr. says uh, to a business associate as BR, Benjamin Roach, is a legal citizen of the United States. Those ships were requested in his name but lest his residence in England during the voyage might affect a deception in care of capture, we do not choose any warranty. And so Benjamin had requested his father secure him an American passport and renew it well until the 1810s, but he also applies for British registers for his British vessels as a British subject in 1803 and 1805. Um, and in case people aren't aware, you're, you, you can't have dual, dual citizenship is a modern invention. It's, it's really a post-World War II thing. And so people can't have two citizenships in this early period. Um, this tactic continues, um, you know, for, uh, for two decades, really. In 1812, Francis writes to his nephew, Thomas, who's currently living in Hartford. Um, and he says, I'm wondering if we can have a new national plan because um, New England is threatening to secede from the United States over the War of 1812 um, and advising him that the family should be prepared for action in the event that New England seceded. So the Roaches were sort of already setting the stage here that if Thomas was going to live in Hartford and New England was going to be its own country, now they were going to have a representative um, within that country too. So um, the clearest example, um, and the one that I'm still the most fascinated by, 
um, is the case of the ship Anne. And so the ship is American built, but French crewed. As you might have suspected by now, it was registered in a number of different ports. The British declare it a French ship and seize it as a war prize. The Roaches pursue the case at Chancery Court using a rather unique argument. They insist that though the captain had been living in France, he was only a resident in that country. And an ancient maritime law held that a captain's true citizenship was determined where his wife lived. And since the captain's wife lived in Nantucket, the Roaches argued it was actually an American ship. So the British were unimpressed. The case dragged on for over a decade. Um, William Sr. put Benjamin in charge of overseeing the case and recovering their losses. Um, and it really, it, it took so long for Benjamin to try and resolve this. This is why that branch of the family permanently relocates to Great Britain. So the case that I'm making here is that a combination of political upheavals, expanding markets, and a unique business allowed three generations of roaches to easily and frequently change their residency. This in turn allows them to play fast and loose with definitions of subject, resident, and citizen, turning ambiguity into profit. Commenters at the time noted as much, often when complaining specifically about the roaches. Thomas Jefferson famously writes, quote, merchants have no country. The mere spot they stand on does not constitute so strong an attachment as from that which they draw their gains. Robert Morris of Pennsylvania, a sort of forgotten founding father, but a very important thinker at the time, says, quote, a merchant as such can be attached particularly to no country. His mere place of residence is, as merchant, perfectly accidental. Fellow Quaker and frequent trading partner Moses Brown writes from Providence, he says, quote, the profits of so gifted and flattering prospect overbalance the ties of country, friends, et cetera. The National Archives um, on their website talking about the roaches um, say that uh, the family was, quote, a clannish, interrelated, resourceful, self-reliant, competitive people who were single-minded in their pursuit of the whale, a sort of Atlantic cartel devoted to commerce and rising above the political storms of the day. And while many of these authors certainly had access to grind, um, it's worth noting that Roach has even been remembered this way in his, um, in his family, in the family um, history. Bullard writes, William Roach considered his first obligation to be his family's financial holding. A national boundary line or allegiance to a flag were decidedly secondary considerations. At this point in my presentation, some people nod along with these quotes and dismiss Roach as a self-interested hypocrite. And I remember a very excellent conversation that I had with another William Roach at the Roach Jones Death House. And he came up after my presentation and he said, well, he sounds to me like a good businessman. And it's true, he was. Um, but as I said to William that night, wouldn't a good businessman have sold those bayonets? And so, you know, I think I, I come back here to 1773 because I don't think the story is as simple as I originally told it. I don't think that Roach's movements during the age of revolution were purely about principle. I don't think that it was only about religion and his opposition to war that sent him from country to country seeking shelter um, from the tumult, from the violence that plagued his family. Um, I think, but on the other hand, nor do I think that he was simply a scheming businessman. You know, I don't think that this was um, a sort of nefarious plot launched by um, an unpatriotic man. Um, I think that these two stories, we need to find ways to have them overlap. Um, we need to find ways to tell more complicated stories about the people of the time. And so I tried to do a little bit of thinking about 1773 um, and what would it mean to start the story of the war in 1773? And I, I, have, I have some ideas about that. And then what would it mean to start the story of our country in 1773? So in terms of starting the story of the war in 1773, I think it's really crucial. You know, I've been telling my students that pandemics 
are social creations. Pandemics have social beginnings and social ending. There's an, you know, there's certainly an epidemiological aspect to this. Just like when we talk about a war, you know, when are people fighting? Where are bullets flying? When we talk about pandemics, you know, where did the disease start? How does it spread? But on the other hand, when do people consider it an emergency? And when do we consider it over? Right. I mean, this is social scientists have been advocating to sort of have a role, have a stake in this process for thinking about how do we how do we describe the times in which we're living? How will we know when it's over? You know, what does normal even mean anymore? And I think for the war, I think it's something I think it's important. It's not just 1776 to 1783. The war, you know, incorporates a broader set of events and it incorporates a broader set of people. And so if we were to start the war in 1773, if we were to say that the Boston Tea Party is when the war for independence or the American Revolution begins, you know, what 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 would we what could we know? What story would we tell? I think that we would tell a really important story that the line between patriot and loyalist was not as clear then as it is now. I think that um, I think that in retrospect, people think that everyone had already chosen sides. And I think I think that people were less clear on what was happening um, and how they were reacting and where their sympathies lie. You know, historians at the time, John Adams says that he thinks the country is divided one third, one third, one third. And that is a third of the country are loyalists, a third of the country are patriots, and a third of the country are neutral. They sort of are, are disengaged. They don't care. When historians run the numbers now, we think that it's more like one-fifth were committed patriots, one-fifth were committed loyalists, and three-fifths were sort of not yet, had not yet chosen a side, were not yet engaged. And so when we think of the story of Francis Roach, you know, Francis Roach has no idea how this is going to go down. You know, he had, he's hedging his bets like so many Americans are. He's not an active loyalist. The Roaches have, um, you know, sort of very fierce criticisms of the king and the monarchy um, and Great Britain, you know, but nor is he willing to cast his lot in with these radicalized patriots. Um, and so he represents the majority of people. He represents the three, three fifths of people who really, um, you know, were concerned about the course that um, that was unfolding. Um, and, you know, the other thing that I um, have thought a lot about, and, um, you know, the terms that that we use now in kind of in kind of modern speech, in the way that people talk about patriotism and nationalism, um, they conflate these terms. And one of the goals of my first book was to try and pull them apart. And when academics talk about the differences between patriotism and nationalism, nationalism means to imagine oneself as part of a fictive community, you know, to, um, to identify with a group of people who share some trait in common with you. So, you know, now we talk about white nationalism. Um, as, as a problem in this country, rightfully so. My book is called Holy Nation because I argued that the nation to which William Roach believed that he belonged was um, a nation of Quakers, a religious nation. Um, Thomas Jefferson, Robert Morris, you know, these people who critiqued Roach argued that there were a nation of merchants, um, a transnational community of business people, that that was the um, community that he belonged to. Um, and, uh, but the idea there, there was not a coherent American nation really that, um, that any of the roaches would have seen themselves as being a part of. It's too new, you know, it's not, um, it hasn't, it hasn't cohered yet. And so then, you know, the question that I, um, I'm interested in thinking about here, I'll stop sharing my screen there is patriotism is, um, Patriotism is pride in institutions. So nationalism is the idea of believing oneself part of an imagined community. 
patriotism is allying oneself with um, allying oneself with the institutions, with the laws, um, with the constitution. And that's what I'd really like to think more about. If we were to think of the United States' story as beginning in 1773, instead of beginning in 1775, beginning in 1776, beginning in 1787, how does that help us think differently about the institutions that would emerge? Institutions that are um, in co-it, institutions that are um, corruptible, corrupt, corrupting at the time, institutions that are, um, you know, are very young and look very different than they do now, and our our memory of them looks very differently than what than than um, than how they presented themselves at the time. So, um, you know, that's my kind of provocative uh, 1773 reconsidered. Um, I would be really happy to chat more with people, fill in blanks about the story, answer questions that anybody might have. Thank you so much, Sarah. I will be the first to say that and let others chime in um, and ask their questions. Um, I'm just going to pause the recording.